You're listening to Capsule on LiveInLimbo.com. My name is Sean Chin, and this is an adventure into music, film, and pop culture. This week on the show, we have some tragic news. We're going to be talking about the, the horrible terrorist attack in Paris. Missy Elliott coming back to the music scene. Prince on why he thinks he was right about the in music business on the internet and foreign and artistic musicians from abroad, foreign artists who can transcend the language barriers and uh, appeal to North American audiences. And today we have back on the show my friend Aga Bahari. How's it going? Pretty good, man. Good morning. Good morning. Yes. Today is Saturday, November 14th. And I guess, so what have you been up to since the last time we talked? When was that? I think that was, was that the Transcendence episode? That was Transcendence, which is uh, like a year ago or something. Wow. So what, what have you been up to, man? Uh, just working here and there, starting a couple more uh, new projects. I just applied for a grant for a project that I have. Very um, cool. And working on music. I have two albums potentially coming out this year, but... We are waiting on development of a platform that we designed and came up with the idea of me and my uh, business partner. Like two albums like in 2015, like two months ago or like one month ago or like next year, early next year? Yes, that's, that's the hope. Okay. But we are waiting to release it through that platform because we're introducing a new approach to the whole thing. Okay. So... That has been very interesting. And then the grant uh, that I have applied for is for a project that will be an improvisation between a human and a computer. Of Algorithm. course. That does, why does that not surprise me? <laughs> that surprised me in, not in the least. <laughs> and uh, you, you've and also you. already like looked into Grammy stuff? You've already done yes. the, the judging? Yes. The first round, I think, um, was over about two weeks ago. Yeah. But then there will be one more round of voting, which happened in uh, December, and then we'll see who will win. Do you think this this is going to be a, a tough year? Tough year in the sense that there is so many good music that it's hard to decide. Yeah. I mean, part of it is music. <laughs> part of it is really is, you know, networking and, you know, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. That's right. So... Um, M- musically, then, do you think it's going to be, is it a tough competition or is there a clear winner? Well, I can only talk about what I think. Yeah. Like, what, yeah. What do you think? Uh, it was not that hard. Okay. Year, That's think. all we need to know. About yeah, yeah. Yeah. The thing is. It was a slow year. The, well, there are a lot of good music out there, but not all of them enter Grammy. Let's mm-hmm. say that, you know. So the music that is being um, submitted to Grammy and they accept it so you can enter the race, it's not only music that matters. There are so many other elements goes with it. It's a business. It's the industry. Absolutely. You know, so <clears throat> I think you can get a little disappointed if you're going in for the, only the music sake of it because um, there are so many other great music that, you know, they, they will never enter Grammy because they just don't care about it. We, we there, there should be an award. It's kind of hard to do anyways because once you have an award, there's going to be politics anyways. But they need to. They yeah, need exactly. To, we need and to I, figure out a way how to make an award. I don't even like. I don't agree with like awards in general for arts and stuff. But like, there has to be a way to do it without politics. I think the best thing would be to have like a record label kind of a deal, but the way that they existed in the 60s, that there were few rich men who, you know, they were just trying music business. And they were like, okay, we don't know what this album is, Frank Zappa or Beatles or whoever, we're just going to put it out and see how it does. And if it's good, profitable, then you can release your second album, you know. Mm -hmm. But that changed into, we know what you want, so it has to go through our filter and those are the music that we have recognized good. And that's only for the sake of the money. You know, but yeah. if there are people who just, you know, being patrons basically help the musicians to get bigger venues to perform. And, you know, there have been a lot of successful independent bands and 
I think one thing that is really challenging now is that there are so many varieties. You have to be really, really good. And that, again, enters that, you know, politics, to have poli- politics in it, that you, you want to sell when you can't make money out of it. You want to make money out of it. So there are certain things that you have to do that make you compromise with the musical side of yourself. But that's fine, you know, because that's a different approach by itself. Absolutely. Well, hopefully they figure that out then. So I guess uh, we have to talk about this very tragic event that came about in the last day or two from when the time you listen to this podcast, but there was a terrorist bombing in Paris. So I think there was four. There's like two on the street, one in front of a rest. Wait, no, two in front of a restaurant, one in front of a soccer stadium and one at a concert hall. That's right. And concert hall, there were also terrorists present and shooting at people. That's right. And I think it kind of, these kind of terrorist events strike everyone around the world. But for our audience at Live in Limbo, I guess it kind of hits a little bit harder because the the concert was um, Eagles of Death Metal. And they're a pretty popular and really well-liked band. So that just hits a little bit harder. But maybe... Do you want to elaborate on your thoughts about this? Because you've been following it all day. Yeah. Um, well, it happened last night when we were talking now, right? Yeah. And I mean, it's a tragedy, but we can't be surprised. It's the same model that's been happening, but had elevated to the level that they has to uh, they have to close the borders in France. And, you know, they say that this, uh, this has been the worst terrorist attack since... Um, uh, the World War Two. That's right. Yeah. Um, so we have to recognize the problem, and the problem is that there are certain radicals from certain religion that using that religion, the political version of it, or fundamentalist version of it, as an excuse to do really messed up stuff. You know, which is not my concern as much as I am concerned about Westerners as Sam Harris called them, regressive liberals, that they are becoming apologists for something that they don't really understand. They're just supporting diversity for the sake of diversity. You know, it doesn't matter what kind of diversity that is. And, you know, we have a big debate going on already, and I think it will just elevate because the other side of this equation are extremists on the other side you know, like skinheads and all those people who are rising to power in Europe. So I don't think the way that we have been treating it, that we are treating it now, will end in any good result. But, you know, we will see. And it's very unfortunate that, you know, you see like suicide bombing that is a news that usually come from like Afghanistan or something. It happening in Paris. And we really have no other choice than to just move on and deal with the core cause of the problem, you know, as collective and very intellectually. But we have been failing, but I I have hopes for humanity. <laughs> it's super, well, you, you gave a little laugh there at the end, but uh, I think like over 150 people have been killed and many more injured. Um, you yourself are from Iran. You're not a Muslim, practicing Muslim, are you? No, I was, well, I was born a Muslim because yeah. my mother was born a Muslim because her mother was born mm-hmm. a Muslim. You know? So I guess, but you grew up in that society. So how, how do you, as someone from there who had roots in it and kind of moved, would you say you moved away from it as far as you could? or? Uh, well, my family was not a religious family. So that helps a lot, you know, because you're already exposed to the religious propaganda all over the place on TV. And when I was growing up, there were only two channels that, you know, one of them was like news every two hour or something with some children program. And then there was a, there was a pause in the middle of a children program in the evening because they had to, uh, it was a call for prayer. You know, and it was yeah. going on for like 20 minutes. You had to wait until your cartoon come back. <laughs> so uh, all this kind of stuff, you know, it, it kind of takes you away from it because all the bad is being related to it, in, especially Iran. 
what what do you think are what's a resolution do you think this will how will this resolve itself what needs to be done the mentality yeah just like what 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 has to happen in culture like for everywhere in order for this to it is move on. well it is a generational thing but you know i think islam single-handedly is the only belief system or religion or whatever you want to call it that hasn't been through major reform. Do you think that reform's happening now? I think this is a two-way, you know, we only have two ways. It's either going to be reformed and uh, people started thinking with a little bit of sense than, you know, tribal values, or it, it's just going to get much worse. You but know. you're right. I think um, each re major religion so far has had that that turning point, except for Islam right now. I think I think it's happening right now with like people like Malala. I think that next generation is the key to moving yeah. on. But and ISIS and those radicals want to kill people like Malala. That they know that is their downfall in the future. And you know the good news is there are a lot of people who, for example, joined. Uh, ISIL in Syria and there was a article about them in Guardian I think it was like two three weeks ago or maybe a month ago that a lot of them send letters home and a lot of them are fr uh, from France ironically enough oh. um, they send letters home though that my iPod has broke and I'm feeling really depressed here I want to come back home so when I read this article that like, these are the people who are the best enemies of the groups that they've joined, you know, because they've experienced it firsthand and they've, they've had enough. They understand the worst things that, you know, um, the worst way that they are being treated in those groups because they just look at you as a number. Yeah. You know? I, yeah. And I saw that you on Facebook and other social media, you've already received some backlash for your, your outspokenness. <laughs> yes, yes, that's that was very interesting. Cool. And what do you want to like summarize a few of them and your response on them? Well, I mean, there are a lot of people. Are these your friends or people who were or ju were just like social media friends, quote unquote? Following these are you? social media, for example, in the case of this guy, or a couple others. You know, I got similar stuff here and there. You get this all the time, not just because of incidents like this, though. <laughs> no, no, because, you know, they, uh, it's, you know, especially because I'm from Iran and then a lot of countries around Iran, they, uh, they would assume that you would be um, on their side. Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of sense of betrayal too to them. And from the left point of view, they're like, well, you're racist and a bigot. And I'm like, well, how can I be racist and a bigot when I was, Mo I had to live in a Muslim country for 23 years, you know, and it's, and it's not racism because Islam is not a race. Yeah. You know, this is something that you, you choose. And the, there's some people who keep um, bringing up, like, how come the good Muslims are not standing up more? What it's are your thoughts true. on that? I, I mean, forget about good Muslims. Like, I Look think we need more people like you. Like, you're not a Muslim, but you're still, you were from there, but you're standing up. Do you think we need more, act, like, practicing Muslims, the good ones, to come out more? Yes, of course. I think it's one Why do you think those... they're not? Uh, well, because at the end of the day, deep down, they believe that, well, you should not... Um, offend our prophet or our religion or in the best case scenario they they see united states imperialism from their point of view as the problem and then they're sympathizing with a movement as a whole they might not agree with every single detail but that's exactly moderate muslims and moderate christians treating their own religion too you know they're not taking every single part of it and have you talked to any of your practicing Muslim friends, like the good ones? And what are their thoughts on it? Practicing Muslim friend, I honestly only have one. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. And, and what is what is that person? Has that person talked to you about, about it? We haven't talked about the latest development yet. I'm going to have coffee actually with him next week because he approached me after uh, a while that we did not talk. But 
you know, they, they, they're not going to go out and kill somebody, but at the same time... Well, not kill them, but, like, just if they, if, if they live in that community, they go to their temples and stuff like that, but they, they must have, like, a eavesdrop or, like, they can see something and then just notify authorities, but they, they don't seem like they want to rat anyone else out either. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And, again, I think it's one of those periods in history that we need to take a stance, you know, because if you want to think about it in a very simple, logical way is that, well, we are looking from this side. So those are bad guys. There are people who are looking from their side, you know, like in Pakistan, Osama is a very, very popular name or in certain parts of Afghanistan because they re they relating Osama bin Laden to the first war with the Soviet Union where Osama bin Laden was a hero, but from our point of view, he's a terrorist. But I don't think this is a time to think like that, and we have to take a stance that you're either with the civilization or you're with, you know, um, promoters of dark ages. And again, I think it's a generational thing, man, because, you know, I've, I've met people from all, all around Islamic countries. It's one of the greatest thing of being in Toronto. You see so many people from different, different parts of the world. And then, you know, uh, the guy who's from Saudi Arabia has the same concerns that I have, that, you know, that girl is beautiful, this weed is good, or whatever, you know. And he's a young, normal guy who is in Canada to study English. So I think education and more westernization, as in the culture of West, how long do you think it will be until Islam has that major reform? But they have to decide among themselves, right? But, but do you think it will be? In, will it be within our lives time, lifetimes, like within the next what thirty years, twenty years, or longer? Um, no, I think it will take much longer. Oh boy! Yeah, but I think what is happening now, which is very positive, is that because of business. But at the same time, because of innovation, there are companies like, uh, not there are companies, companies like Facebook and Google, they're fighting over who spreading free internet, free Wi-Fi connection to most part of the world. And they've started with Africa. So that's like those kind of deal are my favorites because everybody's benefiting from them. You know, you, you just don't you know how much those governments are allowing them to share, though. Uh, well, the governments are also very corrupt, for example, in Africa, right? Like the, Facebook or Google could come in there and give them free internet, but then the government will be like, you can only share this news that we approve. Yeah, but like, for example, Iran is doing the same thing by putting filters, but then they come up with... Uh, yeah, they'll find ways around it. Yeah, and I think that's a good thing too, because there will be a challenge to software developers and all those people who you know, can create softwares and stuff to go, go through the loop, loopholes. Mm. So uh, educationally and generation-wise, you know, I think um, we're heading towards the right direction, but it's, it's very costly. Yeah, all these negative yeah. bad things have to happen, unfortunately, in, in order for that reform to happen. Yeah, but it's, you know, whether we like it or not, we have to go through this. And it is happening, at least, because I remember when the fatwa was uh, released against Salman Rushdie. I was sitting on my grandmother carpet, and they announced it on TV in Iran that this is a fatwa against uh, the writer you know, who wrote Satanic Verses and all that, Salman Rushdie. And everybody were like, well, see, that's why you shouldn't talk bad about Islam. But at least we can't criticize it now. Yeah, um, yeah, I think that's come a long way too. Absolutely, absolutely. And so, what 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 are your thoughts on the countries like Canada that are that are trying to bring in refugees from Syria? So, like um, Justin Trudeau, he our our new Prime Minister of Canada, he wanted to bring, I think, what twenty five thousand refugees 25, 000, yes. before the end of the year. So that's like in a month. Do you think he's going to rethink that now? and other leaders around the world? I mean, if you're going with numbers for the sake of, uh, for whatever reason, other than 
actually doing a decent job, then that would be disappointing. But I think it's something that he can't actually deliver for all the good reasons. Uh, the number is really high for you know a month and a half. So you think he's trying to be over? He's, and, what, and what is the rush? I don't understand the rush. I mean, it's better. Like, do you think that the countries that are... It's, I think it's good that they're going to accept refugees from a war-torn country, but there has to be some scanning process, right? Like a filter to make sure the bad ones don't oh, come absolutely. in. absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And I think why not starting with children who have lost their parents in the war, you know? Because then those are those would be very um, easy to uh, for them to adapt to the Western culture and to educate them. Yes, exactly. So you basically training new Canadians instead of you know because we don't know. You're saying in Syria, one in five they're illiterate. Mm -hmm. That's a big so, number. Yeah, that is a big number, and they are not even you know concerned with that themselves. So when they come here, it's very hard if. Those are the people who are coming, among those people who are coming. Yeah. Uh, it would be very hard for them to adapt. You know, they don't learn the language. Like Canada, there was not an English test for a citizenship exam like until three years ago or two years ago. And you went through that process too. Yes, I applied twice. and the first Congrats time, on that too. Yeah. Thank you so much. The first time I was missing a document, so sent, sent, sent everything back. So I had to add the document to send it again. The first time, there were no English tests. The second time, they put the English test, and you have to prove that you went to an institute or an English class here. So at least you can't speak the language, you know. And I think overall, though, Canada and United States do a much better job for preparing a kind of situation for people to blend in much better than Europe, because in Europe, you see there are neighborhoods that, like if you're not, for example, in London, they have their own neighborhoods that uh, Muslims. That if you're not a Muslim, you're not even like welcome there. Wow, that's you know? pretty round. Uh, yeah, in Paris, the same thing. So we kind of have to come to a balance to understand how not offending all the population, but also pointing out the cause of a problem that those all those people might put as a cornerstone of of their belief. You know because. I mean, what good would this, this do to even Muslims to go and kill hundred and some people, innocent people, in their home? That they're they're not in their in your country. Why you're not fighting with the people who are in your country? Exactly. So yeah, that's it's very so, terrible. Yeah. 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 We have to come up with a balance, and I hope that we do. But it you know it it just takes time and education and generational improvement. I think. Absolutely. Well. Well, I hope and you hope that this improves very soon. I don't think there's any real way to segment away from that topic. So, but um, <laughs> <laughs> we just we just have to jump into another one. Next one. So, we'll try to look on the bright side, bright, bright side of the industry, music industry this week. Um, I guess M Missy Elliott is back. Yes, that's a very good news. And that's some good news. Very um, good. She's back with her uh, new uh, vi music video for like. It's been like seven years. It's called WTF, Where Are They From? Featuring yeah. Pharrell Williams. And uh, I think it's pretty cool. I think the world has missed this street rap and like her mixes and the outfits and the big production values of her videos. And I love it. What, what, what do you think? I think it's great. It's a very good move from both side of the industry and for the fans. Because from the side of industry... Um, obviously copycats aren't working anymore, so you need some unique characters to be, you know, uh, as your leading artists, leading figures. And for the fan, it works best because Missy Elliott is Missy Elliott. There's nobody like her. And it's it was awesome. I just watched the video before, do, before starting the uh, talk today. And I think it's great. It's great in... Uh, writing, it's great in wardrobe, it's great with light and camera and everything. It's it's a treat. The song is super catchy too, but I think the coolest part. What what are those um the two wheel things called again? Like the skateboard, the automatic ones. Oh but, yes, um, I've never seen anyone dance on them before. That was yeah, unique. yeah. It was very good. I was like, whoa, you can do that. <laughs> now I was going to ask you if you know if Pharrell had anything to do with the music. Oh, what well, is. He, I, I, he's not in the video, but like the puppet 
the puppeteer thing. No, I know, but like making the, I know that. Oh, I'm sure he had something to do with the production. Yeah, then it's awesome. That guy is very, very good. He's everywhere. Yeah. Well, he's very good. You know, he's uh, such a diverse kind of a person and very smart and knows where, you know, where the money is, but at the same time, uh, compromise in the best way possible. You know, you create pop music, but it's an awesome pop music. That is very true, too. Yeah. Yeah. Have you run into him at the Grammys? Uh, I have a story, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. It, I probably it shouldn't share it online. Oh, yeah, you can. It's fine. He said it was okay. <laughs> no, it's, it's just like in a group of people and he was there. But uh, uh, And you were nearby? I was nearby, yeah. Oh, so you were within like 10 meters of him? That would be fair. Okay, yeah. that's cool. Yeah, but I don't think that's such a weird thing if you're like in, in the industry. Yeah, if you're there anyways, yeah. You know, because obviously they're not as open to other people because other people only want to get stuff for themselves. Well, you, you can know? be like, I'm a guy, I'm a musician too. Yeah, maybe maybe next time I have to do that. Like go and introduce myself and all of that. But I was also amazed uh, of everything. It was the first year. Oh, yeah. So you were starstruck, kind of. A I, I kind of was, you know, because uh, from the point of view of industry, this is it. Like Grammy, Grammy it is. It's like the equivalent of Oscar in yeah. this industry. And, uh, you know, it's cool. It's, well, you get starstruck, but at the same time, you come to a, re- a realization that, well, this, you know, these are buildings and these are people and, uh, it, you know, they have just elevated and they have progress in a certain way and it's completely doable. And I think it's a combination of that realization and at the same time, all the lights and all the, you know, that it really gets you or it got me. <laughs> you know? I guess it has to hit you the first time, but uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. It becomes uh, as usual after that da- daily business. Uh, so I guess in other news, uh, Prince, our good friend Prince, mem- remember when I waited for like four hours in line at Massey Hall for that? That's situation? right. Yeah, nothing <laughs> happened. But anyway, so he's back in the news, and this time he's kind of taking a jab at everyone that likes connected stuff like you and I, because he says in quotes, um, it says uh, in 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 response to another interview, what I meant was that the internet was over for anyone who wants to get paid. I was right about that. He says, "Tell me a musician who's got rich off digital sales. Apple's doing pretty good though, right?" So I guess he's taking a jab at the industry. Was saying the companies behind it that offer the service platforms and services are the the real ones making the money. Then the labels are making the money. And then the artists are the ones who are getting like the 10 cents at the end. Yeah. Well, those companies have replaced even labels. Yeah, I think that's going to happen. That's slowly happening. It's just amazing. And do you agree with him, though, that no artist has made money from the internet? What do you think? Is he kind of over-exaggerating as usual there? Um, Well, I guess they've given up. Because people like Lord... They needed the internet in order to get to the level of fame they had. That's they maybe right. not be as rich as Prince or make that level of royalty, but if it wasn't for the internet, they wouldn't have got any kind of fame. Also, it, I, I highly doubt that it was in the cornerstone of founding the internet that musicians also have to get rich. You know, there are many greater purpose for internet. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it has served um, independent artists tremendously well because how could you put one track and being heard by like millions of people t- 10 years ago you know there is no no way really or 20 years ago you had to go through those labels to you know release your music and get an advertisement on a radio and all basically market your music yeah but i think maybe maybe he's comparing like back in the day let's, let's say you only get like 10 people to buy your album but you would make like 50 percent of the royalty versus now you can be heard by a million people but you make like three cents yeah well industry has changed you know like 100 years ago opera singers were the biggest stars anybody could be now are movie stars and you know those make the most money so uh, things change and we have given up making certain artists rich for the sake of having more diversity and having uh, free access to music i like that yeah me too 
That's great. <laughs> That's why you're here. <laughs> um, so also, uh, since he t- took a stab at Apple there, Apple is finally going to be pulling or disc- disservicing, is that the right word? D- decommissioning the Beats music streaming service on, uh, on November 30 because that's no longer needed. They have Apple Music. Um, I think a few weeks ago on the podcast, we said they had after their free trial they had like 12 million subscribers in the free trial then after the three months ended they had 6.5 million paid subscribers left over and that they gained that within the four months versus it took that it took seven years six or seven years for spotify to gain that many paid subscribers have you have you played around with apple music at all uh no not yet really i thought you would have for sure yeah, um, you of I'm all not, people. <laughs> well, because I download a lot of music um, from illegal means, not oh. illegal means, but pirating. Oh, okay. You explicitly um, say that. That's okay. That's cool. Yeah, but th- I, that's what I do. <laughs> you know, and if I like it, then I buy the album. Oh, okay, so you do buy the album if you like it. Yeah. What, what, what would you say like the turnover rate is? If I like the album. Yeah. No, like how many of the music that you download that you like that you go buy it after? Oh, like uh, literally if they're independent and if they are good and innovative and creative, I will definitely buy that because it's not only that you buy the music, which is cool to support the music, but you also support the idea. Yeah. And when you buy the music, are you like downloading it through iTunes or like buying a vinyl? When I'm buying it, I'm buying it from iTunes. Okay. No, so so Apple's doing well as Prince said. Yes, definitely. <laughs> and I think what he says is is true that there are companies that are getting rich, not the artists. But at the same time, you gotta, you know, it's good to look at it from both sides, technology and from the artist's point of view. From technology, it's genius what they're doing. I you think know, and, I really yeah. wanted to get your opinion on like Beats One, like aside from Apple Music, like the streaming service, like what are your thoughts on Beats One with like Zane Lowe and like the 24 hour, seven days a week radio station that doesn't have a genre focus? Yeah. Uh, a great approach, but I think they had branding problem with it that they're moving on to something that has the name of the Apple on it. You know, because if you want to compete with Spotify, it's incredibly hard to convince people to use the exact same service when they've been using it for, you know. For a while, it has all your database, uh, and it just gets better and better the, the more it knows about your taste in music. So starting all of that from the scratch, but iTunes, is, uh, Apple is suggesting that we are already taking it from the music that you have in your library. You know, so we just start from there. Like for a company, for, for a service that's only been out for like a few months, not even half a year yet, I think they've, they've made a huge like dent in the business for against a company like Spotify who's been around for like eight years now. Yeah, we probably end up with like four companies in the world. That's kind of what I don't like though. Like I yeah, like the true. idea of streaming. I ha- I'm cool, like totally 100% cool with paying that $10 a month for it. But it's just that sometimes when you want to make a playlist and share it, a few two songs will be on Apple Music and they won't be on Spotify. Three songs will be on Spotify, but they won't be on Apple Music. And then then you have a problem. And then you can go to YouTube and listen to the whole thing probably for free. For now, until that YouTube red thing kicks in for sure. You know. That's paid subscriptions. And then you have to subscribe to three things. That's right. But then don't you think that I would never subscribe to the YouTube red thing. Yeah, I wonder what like what are they going to charge for? I think like, it, you, like you wouldn't be able to see any videos if you don't pay that. that no, if you don't pay, you you get the ads. But I already have ad block, and I don't see any ads. So yeah, but they're they're, they're not. Yeah, you're you're different. <laughs> no, but there are a lot of people that they can use ad block. You know, but uh, I would ad- say the vast majority of people don't know how to use ad block. Yeah, well, that's unfortunate. And but the, I think the real issues for the content creators because instead of like Psy getting directly the whatever twenty cents a view for his two billion views, like t- multiplied that, he would get only a portion of that 
from the ten dollars a month. Yes, and, that's yeah. right. So I think the content creators are actually the ones that are going to get hit. Um. Well, it will be, I think, bigger and more expensive and more, you know, uh, corporately backed probably videos. But also, isn't YouTube like mainly watched by like kids and teens? So I I doubt their parents would give them credit card funds to subscribe to that. Yeah, that's right too. But I think, you know, you probably can get access to the database of um, through their API and use their database in the new service and don't charge people anything, you know, and, you know, these are the evolution of this whole thing. And I really enjoy witnessing it. And it's, I guess it's a big deal if you wouldn't be able to watch videos for free on YouTube. But, it is fun you know. to watch it unfold. Yeah, man, you learn so much. You know, <laughs> yeah. The amount of stuff that you can learn for free from YouTube, it makes you a much better person. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. I've learned a lot from that, too, like starting up the podcast and websites yeah. and stuff like that. It's all good. All right, so let's talk about something really fascinating that tr- transcends the language barrier. I want to talk to you, I think, because you have, you're more experienced in this and listening to this, but like foreign artists that you think North American audiences will like. Like for myself, I think the first one that I really liked was Sigaros from Iceland. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No English, but I love it. And then you went to see Jem. She's a, a, a star from China at yes. the Air Canada Center headlining. What how was that show? I was great. And I wrote the review that I sent you. That's right. You'll find that at the link in the show notes below. Um it's you know it's just amazing how the Western culture made its way to China and they're picking it up from there and making their own basically. The light was amazing, the sound was amazing, the videos were awesomely designed and uh, amazing, and it was a very very good show. But she was just, uh, singing um, to a specific group of. Uh, crowd you know age wise and then language wise so that's separate a little bit but overall i thought i thought it was a very good show and so just to get things straight you you knew nothing about her before i had i had no i I literally texted you like maybe four hours before or maybe not even and i was like hey do you want to see this person (laughs) yeah yeah and i'm glad i did and i appreciate that you contacted me um was it what you were expecting? Like, what were you expecting before getting in there? I, I don't really I have any expectation. I, 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 it, you will be much happier if you enter any kind of a situation without expectation. <laughs> and Did you feel uh, out of place in the audience? Um, no. Would you, it, it was mainly that, Chinese people, though. Mo- mainly Chinese, yeah, but also Canadians. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. That's cool. So it's just great, you know. Uh, it's a uh, trading of cultures in, in a very new way. You know, it's based on Western culture, which is more attractive, obviously, for most of the world. And then they, they make their own variations of it, and they're coming back now to offer their point of view and their creation. I, I think it's amazing. As someone who's Chinese, like I'm Chinese, yeah. I was born here, though. My parents are, my mom's from Shanghai, my dad's from Hong Kong, so I can... And then I can understand where the shift now is happening. As you mentioned in your review, like it's still China's still a communist country, but I think they're the most, I heard, I forgot what the exact phrase was, but they're the most capitalist communist country. And those yeah. two kind of, that's kind of a contradiction in a way, but it's good because they're moving forward. Oh, absolutely. And I think China, um, has had already a very, very fascinating history, and I think uh, it will continue to have a very fascinating history. Um, And I'm looking forward to hear and see more. I've been familiar with Chinese cinema, and it's interesting, but, you know, it's just getting better and better and better. There needs to be more artists like, like Jem from these countries, like not just China, but like any repressed country, even like Iran or something like that, those... those, um, those so-called radical states, like there needs to be breakout people of Gem's age demographic that will push the barriers. I agree. I agree. Well, the, in the case of Iran, there are a lot of good artists. Like, but like you got banned. That's right. 
Do you think if you were to do that now, would you would that still have happened, or do you think if you were there now, starting that heavy metal band, things would be different now? Um. Well, when we started that whole thing, things were, you know, okay, even better than now. For oh, really? Time. Okay. What yeah. year was that again? This is two thousand and two. And you think two thousand two is better than now? You see, what happened was that a reformist become a president in Iran. Like a good reformist or a bad reformist? Well, it was the first reformist ever. He started the reformist movement, basically. Because before that, it, it belonged to fundamentalists. So people got very excited about him. And for the first two, three years, uh, everything opened up. But then there was a bit of a problem. Like that was the president. who. So he became the president and then you decided to make this band? Well, it was our age too. Yeah. Right. So it was like being at the right place at the right time, I suppose. And we just used that. But even then you had to go through a place which is called Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance to get permission to do anything culture related. It can be a concert or a record or a book. Or a film. And we, even there, you know, even though things were a little bit more open, we had to lie about it and just give them tracks that were sped down, you know, that were slower by like half, half, uh, 50% slower than what we actually uh, were going to perform. So they don't think it's rock or metal. Oh, really? Even like the speed, like the tempo, that's crazy. I didn't know that. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of a lot of it, I told you, I'm working on the book about this whole thing. And Oh, you're writing a book? Yeah, we're like almost done with the second. Oh, cool. Book. Yeah. When, when do you think that will be out? I want to finish the second draft and the third draft, which will be the editor job by the end of the year. So next year I can start looking for publishers. Very cool. We'll have you on the show again for sure. Um, so who are some some artists like Jem, foreign artists that are pushing the mold? Well, I mean, you mentioned Cigarette, and I would say Bjork from the same country. Yeah. Uh, and Bjork has been amazing for many, many, many years. Um, Amon Tobin, I don't know if you know him. He's a Brazilian electronic musician. Nope. Uh, incredible, incredible stuff. Uh, I have enjoyed Boards of Canada. Okay. And um, my friend, he's a guitar player, jazz guitar player in Austria, and he's really one of the very few uh, Iranians who did something worthy in the mixture with um, Western music and mixing it with Persian uh, elements. And uh, his name is Mahan Mir Arab. And I think he's been doing a fantastic job. Okay. All of these names will be in the show notes if you want and links. How about like, yeah, more, more from like the Middle East. Like, is there any, any artists out there that are on the same verge of being banned or like, like, I guess, revolting against the government? Uh, oh, what's well, it called? I also have to mention like Pussy Riot. They're from Russia. I think they. That's right. Yeah, they're they're breaking the mold too. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Well, Russia has you know it's like it is tyrannical, but it's not as closed as as tightly controlled as Iran. I would say mm -hmm. because in Iran it had become a norm to be that tightly controlled, and that's very unfortunate. Um, there are a lot of uh, new artists coming, actually, from Iran, from the new generation rock and metal, especially, I know, and some hip-hop. The hip-hop is my favorite ones because I don't see how Persian language can work with rock or metal, Western, purely Western rock and metal music. So I'm not really into that. But, uh, you know, interesting things are happening. What they need to do has um, to, is to have a platform to perform in front of people, you know, and have, you know, the process that exists here. That it doesn't matter. You can you can be a band for a week. You can go talk to a bar, 
and perform for a couple of people and then get their feedback and evolve based on that. But if that does not exist in Iran, because of that, most of it comes online, which uh, gives a very interesting variety to um, underground and independent music that is coming from Iran. But I think innovation-wise, there are very few people. Mahan Mir Arab is one of the one of the guys who has been innovating and uh, pushing it forward. Um, he's a hip hop are... artist. Or... No, he's a jazz guitar. jazz guitarist. Yeah. What about uh, some of the hip hop artists you're talking about from Iran? Do you, what what are some of their names if you can give us some? Um or just a scene in general. Yeah, I can't think of anybody in specific, but it this is a movement that started um I would say about 10 years ago, 10 11 years ago or there must have been before that, but that that was when we who were inside of these things heard about it. The government's so, more open to them than like rock music. The government is not open to them. Oh, okay. And yeah, they they've been uh, also hip hop artists who have been arrested and jailed just because of the music that they were putting out through their blog or website or whatever. And uh, but it has it has had the faster I think and more logical evolution than rock and metal side of. Um, Iranian music scene, underground music scene. And then you have traditional Iranian music scene that they have been tolerating since the beginning of a of the revolution. But even then, the greatest master of traditional music is a singer named Muhammad Reza Shajarian. And he were not able, he was not able to perform in Iran for about 10 years now because he's taught, he's criticized the government. Oh, so he was performing in the accepted traditional form, but he was putting out controversial lyrics and not messages. Con not even controversial lyrics. He had, he has criticized Criticism. Yeah. Uh, a very, you know, a, a different elements that has something to do with the system that is governing Iran in an interview. You know, he's a very honest man and he's very open about his opinion and he see no reason to lie about it. You know, he should be treated as the best master. I haven't liked, uh, I've never liked uh, traditional music from Iran for a second, but you got to, you know, these are not the thing that has anything to do with music. The man has been very innovative and he's a legend of the music of that country and his band, you know, wow. whenever he comes to like England or Canada or U.S., Every single show is sold out because people have a lot of respect. He's authentic. But you have the same problem with filmmakers, you know. If their film has any kind of underline that can be interpreted as a... Anti-government or something. Not even that. You know, if you criticize. You know, can't even do that. No. No, you can't really get... It's a very fine line between politics... With, with political art and un, art that is not political. And it's very, very difficult to keep it separated. Anything you do can be interpreted as a Western influence or whatever. And it's not a very healthy uh, environment, but at the same time, you see a lot of talents still doing what they do. You know, a lot of people leave Iran to do what they do, play their music, make their movies, and that's admirable, you know, that even in the worst-case scenario for that country, even though, well, it's not worst-case scenario, but it's, it's pretty bad. It can be much, much better. Uh, there is still, you know, creating art, and I think that's amazing. I think, I think this is really good. It ties back to what we first talked about in this episode, but the young, the energetic, and the next generation will use music, film, and art to push forward like all this death unnecessary death in your in paris and around yeah. the world is kind of a necessary for this reform to happen unfortunately but at the same time people like um i can't even pronounce the name you'll have to give me it after but the the artists from like the iranian community they will use this form to push forward yeah absolutely I mean, we have to evolve, you know, it's, 
the, one of the greatest elements in nature is water, and you cannot keep water at, at one place. You know, it moves and shapes everything around it, and uh, it's just a continuous stream. And that's what we are, and as as we should be, and we should experience our uh, express our experiences throughout the way through whatever creative mean that we decide to do. You know, but I don't know that uh, country. Unfortunately, the problem hasn't been dictators the problem has been dictatorship that we've always got uh the gun from or a sword or whatever from the hand of one person and giving it to the other person so we need an enlightenment of our own from uh, from the iranian perspective but i think we are moving towards the right direction and as you said these are all part these are all part of the evolution in um, they're unfortunate, but hopefully they result in the best case scenario. Absolutely. It's always enlightening and enriching to talk to you, Aga. Thanks yeah, for coming man. on Thank the show. You. I appreciate it. Where can all of our listeners find you and your projects? Uh, they can Google Aga Bahari, and that's the best way to go. My website is disconnected from my main domain, which is agabahari.com now, but will be reconnected in about 10 days. Uh, but I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, on Instagram. It's pretty easy to find me. Your, your uh, Twitter and your Instagram is at Agologist. Yes. And that's right. Yeah. And so you can find myself on Twitter at Sean Chin. You can follow the show at Live in Limbo. Use the hashtag Capsule Podcast to join in on the conversation. Please subscribe to this show in iTunes. Give us five stars and leave us some nice reviews in the comment section. And as always, you can find the show notes at liveandlimbo.com slash capsule. See you next time.